<laughs> because I knew that I'm chairman, I was sitting <laughs> just to start with a joke. Once I was sitting behind, and people were looking for chairman, and they want this session to be very short. And that happened that me was a chairman. Half an hour. <laughs> so, sure, sure. Okay, so it's first of all my great pleasure to start this first session dedicated to my great friend and brilliant physicist, as we all know, Ricardo Barbieri. So I'm really happy to be here at this occasion. And our first talk here is by Antonio Riotto. And the title is Consistent Re Consistency Relation for Large Scale Structure of the Universe. Yeah, Tony, go ahead. But does it work? Oh, yeah, it does. Okay, very good, thank you. I would like to thank Ricardo for being uh, not only a special physicist, but especially a really special human being. So that has to be said in any occasions. I was told not to give a celebrative talk, of course, so let me go into the details. Uh, today I'm going to talk about uh, a subject which is um, something we have been uh, uh, addressing very recently, which is the uh, um, idea of finding uh, world identities, if you like, to connect to field theory, but this time in cosmology and especially in the last case structure. So the plan of the talk is uh, quite simple. Uh, I will have a very short and in fact simple mind introduction to large case structure for the non-experts. So I won't of course go into detail. And then I will go uh, directly to the role of symmetries uh, in, the, in the last case structure. What I'm going to talk about is the result of a series of papers that I've been uh, um, writing collaborators with um, uh, people at the University of Geneva, some students. But it's, uh, this is a subject that has been uh, also addressed by lots of other people. Some of them are here in this room. Paolo Criminelli, Filippo Vernizzi, for instance. Also the Padova group has been contributed to it and also in Sacle. So uh, Planck has given us a very simple um, picture of the universe. We know uh, what the universe is made of. Uh, we know, of course, that there is 30% of dark matter. The majority of the energy density is in terms of uh, energy, of dark energy. But of course, the most important um, uh, data, that uh, what the data are telling us, the most important thing is, in fact, that the, uh, the lambda CDM is matching uh, the, uh, the, the lambda CDM model is matching the data pretty well. And uh, especially the fact that um, this data can be explained in terms of a very simple idea, which is simply uh, the idea of uh, primordial inflation. Primordial inflation is, of course, a period during the evolution of the universe where the universe expands very quickly. And uh, because of that, structures can form uh, late in the evolution of the universe thanks to um, basically the, the creation of quantum fluctuations uh, during the uh, inflationary period. The idea is very simple. You have uh, quantum fluctuation on uh, microscopic scales, and those are amplified by the, the very uh, quick expansion of the universe to microscopic scales, to astrophysical and astronomical scales, and the perturbation leaves the Hubble radius, which is this um, uh, horizontal line there, and then they re-enter the horizon, they re-enter our local universe much later in time, and we see them under the form of temperature anisotropies or um, uh, mass abundances, if you like. So that's the main idea. So the idea is uh, a picture in this, uh, in this uh, uh, Simulation, so you have quantum fluctuations on a microscopic scales, and then we see them in phase by observation in the form of uh, galaxy distributions or halo distributions. And of course, at the end of the day, when uh, the perturbation re-enters the horizon, what happens is simply that gravity takes over, and that's the responsible for the structure we see in the universe. So this is a simple picture. You have a small inhomogeneity 
to begin with on the, uh, on the uh, bottom there. And then gravity, of course, is attractive and you start forming structures. And one of the goals of cosmology today is to describe these structures in terms of some basic parameters and to understand if uh, everything fits. This is a simple uh, movie that describes what I just told you uh, dynamically. So it's a simulation, of course, uh, which is called the millennium simulation. You have a bunch of particles whose mass in the simulation is supposed to be 10 to the 6 solar masses. So let me go back. At the beginning, you start from an almost homogeneous universe, which is the one that inflation is giving you. And then the, the gravity takes over. Uh, gravity is attractive, as I said. And then, of course, you start forming more and more clusters and uh, bounded object. Okay, so this is basically what is going on. And we want to understand from first principle the, the, the dynamics of this process and get information out of it. In this kind of simple-minded simple, simple -minded pictures, galaxies are, uh, have to be interpreted as peaks of the dark matter distribution. So the universe has a dark matter uh, distribution, as I said, 30%. There are fluctuations generated originally by, by inflation. And only when there are peaks uh, above some a given threshold, we say that uh, galaxies, or in any case halos, tend to form precisely on those locations. And we can find the correlation function of galaxies that we can observe uh, by direct observation in terms of the underlying dark matter distribution. So here there is a simple formula that tells you that the density contracts of galaxies, for instance, in this simple picture is a function, which is a local function, that's the reason why the model is called local, of the density contract of the dark matter. And then you tailor expand, and uh, the coefficient, which are the coefficients of this tailor expansion, are called bias parameters. So one of the goals of, uh, of the uh, nowadays cosmology is to understand how these bias parameters behave and to uh, relate, of course, them to the, the, to the underlying dark matter distribution, because that is related to inflation itself. Once you, you accept that the, uh, this full picture, then what you can do is to describe the density contrast, which is, of course, the dark matter distribution at the given point, uh, compared to the average one. You can do a Fourier transform. And then, of course, you start computing correlators. Those are the observables that we can, we can measure. So for instance, there, it's the power spectrum, the two-point correlator, which, of course, depends in the inflationary picture, um, depends on the initial power spectrum, which is a simple power law, k to the n, where n is called the spectral index. And then, of course, you have a transfer function that takes care of the post-inflation evolution because of gravity. Of course, one can compute, and one has to compute, because those are observables, more and more correlators are the three-point and the four-point correlators. Um, in, as a final product of the evolution of the universe. Now, what is the problem here to face? The problem is, of course, that structures, by definition, are nonlinear objects. A typical halo um, has, a, has a density contract which is about 200 or even more. So it's clear that uh, even when you start from the initial condition provided by inflation, which is uh, 10 to minus 5 in density contrast, when gravity starts acting and the uh, clamps start uh, becoming operative, then of course the density constant starts growing and you reach very soon the uh, regime where the perturbations are not linear anymore. So here I wrote down the equation for the, uh, for the uh, linear density contrast. And you see the solution of it is that density constant grows like the scale factor. The scale factor of course is increasing during the expansion of the universe and therefore very quickly at a given scale, delta becomes of order unity. It is fair to say that uh, perturbation theory um, that you naively uh, apply does not work because you expand the density contracts as a sum of uh, contributions at, uh, the, let's say, the first order, the second order, the third order, and so on. And take, for instance, the second order. The second order grows like the square of the, of the uh, scale factor, and therefore, Again, you uh, eat the non-perturbative regime very, very quickly. People have, uh, during the last few years, uh, worked out many analytical methods to take care of it. But uh, it is fair to say that all of them fail as soon as you, you, you look at the structure of the universe when the universe, let's say, at the size of about 10 megaparsec, which compared to the full horizon, which is about 3,000 megaparsec, is not uh, terribly small. 
The reason is very simple to understand is because if you look at the variance of the density constant, which is indicated there by this quantity sigma, you see that uh, around uh, 10 megaparsec, which corresponds to an halo of about 10 to the 14 solar masses, the variance becomes of order unity. So this is another way of saying what I just, uh, uh, of seeing what I just said in words. Okay, so the lesson here is that already 10 megaparsec structures are highly nonlinear and you have to resort to something which is not uh, analytical. So either you do embody, so you are very good in numerical and um, in numerical simulations, and the movie that I show was a product of it, or you apply a simple um, a principle that uh, Ricardo told me when I was here, back in uh, year 2000, he said it is always better to look at things from the top rather than from the bottom. Okay, he was not speaking about physics, but uh, I applied that uh, to physics, which I think is a very good uh, advice. So the question that I'm going to address in this uh, talk is the following. It's a very simple one. Is it possible to get information about the last case structure or the galaxy correlation functions at non-linear scales where there is no uh, way to apply the uh, perturbative computations by using symmetries? Okay, so that's a very simple uh, idea, uh, which works very well in quantum field theories um, in many occasions. And of course, if one can do it, then uh, it's a very uh, rewarding because, of course, one can check if the same analytical methods that people have worked out, which fail at some point, or even the embodied simulations are correct, because this relation will be, uh, will be completely trustable at any scale. And of course, it gives also a, a, a way of testing uh, what people are up to in cosmology now. For instance, the theory of bias, the way you relate the galaxies we observe to the underlying dark matter distribution, which we are not able to observe directly, of course, only through gravity. We can test, of course, the modification of gravity at large distances, something that people have been really up to uh, because of the acceleration of the universe, or you can test even the initial condition of the universe, like non gaussianity and so on and so forth. These consistent relations are, you know, in the quantum field theory language, they are in fact world identities, and some people of the, of the, of that, uh, some of the names of the I mentioned before, in fact, attack this problem for, from the uh, quantum field theory point of view. But I, I, I will take another perspective. So my, my, the way we attacked this problem was very simple. We wrote down the equation the, for the galaxy distribution and the dark matter uh, distribution. Those are fluid equations, so there are simplifications underlying um, uh, them, of course. I will come back to this, uh, to this simplification later on in the talk. But these equations are very simple. They are, there is just mass conservation for galaxies and, uh, and dark matter. Of course, in the galaxy equation, you see a term which might take care of the, of the idea, of course, the galaxy form and merge at some point. Then you have the momentum conservation equations, and of course, you have Poisson equation. So in principle, these equations are highly nonlinear, are already complicated by themselves, even though they come from, from the last of um, Poisson equation in, in phase space. But it's already quite interesting to start from, from them, because we can learn something. So these equations have a lot of symmetries, which uh, some of them have been known since uh, the 70s. For instance, there is a, a, a symmetry which is lina re realized linearly, which is a kind of Lipschitz symmetry. If you change tau and uh, so your conformal time, your time and your variable x, by some multiplicative factor, which is not the same in, um, for the time and, and space, then the density contracts, the deltas and the velocities, and the gravitational potential transforms in a given way. That was known already by Peebles, and the uh, application has been uh, worked out as well. But what I would like to talk about today is, in fact, another symmetry that uh, we, it's a sort of extended Galilean symmetry, which does not transform tau, but transforms uh, the shifts, basically, the space coordinates, and you can find what are the, uh, the new uh, density contrasts and velocities and the gravitational potential because of this transformation, okay? Meaning that if you have a solution of your problem, you can make a coordinate transformation and generate another solution, okay? So why is that uh, interesting for us? 
It is interesting because if you look at the velocity, how the velocity transforms, it transforms non-linearly because it gets shifted, of course, because of, it's a sort of Galilean transformation. And then, of course, since you see that from, uh, from this relation V goes into V plus something, then immediately you realize that you can do something with that. And in fact, this is a trick. It's a trick that people use in, uh, in inflationary physics uh, very frequently. You can say, OK, I have this long wavelength mode of perturbation. So let's suppose that you have, uh, a, um, you have a sphere, and you look at galaxies inside this sphere. Okay? And let's say the sphere is on short scales. So I'm dealing with nonlinear physics. I don't know how to describe this nonlinear physics whatsoever. But on the top of it, I add a long wavelength mode perturbations. Okay? Now, this transformation tells me that I can go to a coordinate system where I eliminate the velocity of the, the long wavelength velocity. And therefore, uh, since this transformation is a symmetry, I generate another solution. In this coordinate system, there is no perturbation on the long wavelength mode. Okay? So in order to compute the correlators of the true system where there is a velocity perturbation, so the first term on the left hand side, I can change my coordinate system, kill the long wavelength mode, so all the physics of the, well, almost all the physics of the long wavelength mode, and compute the correlators in this simple, uh, simple way. Okay? This is basically a consistent relation that the system has to satisfy uh, because of this uh, symmetry that is uh, underlying the system. If you go to momentum space, you can, uh, of course, uh, rewrite this, uh, solu this uh, consistent relation in, uh, in a simple way. And this tells you uh, that any n plus 1 correlator that you can write down, as long as one of the modes go to 0, so it's a long wavelength mode, has a very well-defined uh, uh, relation with the n correlator, which is at short scales. This relation is exact and uh, um, does not need any knowledge of the short scales that you have uh, in the system. So, of course, you can write down similar relations for the other quantities, like the overdensity, the dark matter over density. I wrote it for the galaxy over density, which is the one we observe, and for the velocity and the gravitational potential. So, why is that interesting? Is it interesting because um, they are, as I said, they are valid at any short nonlinear scale, so I don't need to know, I, didn't, I don't need to solve the physics at short scales. So, uh, they are valid for the dark matter abundance, but especially, and that's very important for the galaxies, independently of the bias. So I don't need to know anything how to relate, uh, about how to relate the dark matter and the bias. It is valid even when there is uh, the single stream approximation phase, because of course, when the structure forms, there are uh, flows of dark matter, so there are, uh, there are basically intersection, and uh, you lose the, the fact that at the given point, the velocity is single valued. And uh, of course, also it's interesting because if the symmetry is violated, of the, the, this consistent relation will be also not, uh, not valid. And as I said, it can also be used to check whatever people have done uh, analytically. So there are a uh, lot of cons from, uh, in writing this, uh, these equations. Uh, of course, when you observe the real universe, you, don't, you're, you're not using spatial coordinates and time coordinates. You have to go to, uh, to what is called Rashi space, because, of course, you observe galaxies in a two-dimensional space. So we, we also been able to, to write this, uh, this consistent relation in, in uh, Rashi space, which is the, what the observers use, and, um, and it's basically similar to, to what is in, in, uh, in real space, but has to be done because, of course, as I said, observers are using, are using this one. And uh, different groups have obtained the same result. Now, uh, there is a nice a connection that has been pointed out by, by the group uh, uh, of Paolo uh, Criminelli and Filippo Vernizzi, who are here, which is the following, that you can get basically the same results, or in fact even extended it to, relativistic, uh, to the relativistic case, because what I've just so far is not relativistic. 
In the case in which um, you can remove the long wavelength mode uh, from the metric, from the perturbation that you have in the game, and you can connect this uh, argument to the, uh, to the equivalence principle, therefore. So let me tell you very quickly how does it work. So you start from your metric, which is, uh, let's say, in the Poisson gauge, which has a perturbation in, t in terms of the 0, 0 part and the, and the ij part. And uh, you can collect one of the, of the 1 plus 2 phi in front of the metric. Here I'm talking about any Freeman-Robertson-Walker universe, which is uh, parameterized by the growth factor tau to the minus 2q. Q can be minus 2, for instance, during matter domination. And here the idea is to say, OK, I have one point surrounded by this sphere where you are dealing at short scales. And then I start perturbing this long wavelength mode into the zero mode, phi L, at the given point, and into the gradients, and I neglect the, the, the two derivatives. Okay? So if I work in this approximation, what I can do, I can make a series of transformation, my coordinates. I can do a dilatation plus a special conformal transformation that eliminates one of the, the, the piece which is uh, in front of the dx squared there. Then I do another. Uh, so I rewrite the metric in terms of uh, a common factor times a, a the sitter metric. For those of you that uh, work with the sitter, they will realize that this is the, the, the sitter metric. And then I apply an isometry of the sitter, which does not change the, the metric over there, the, the sitter one, because it's an isometry, and I can rewrite everything in terms of an unperturbed metric. So what I can do, basically, I can remove the long wavelength mode by a series of coordinate transformation, which are fully relativistic, and eliminate the long wavelength mode. And because of that, I can uh, write down uh, or reobtain what I just said before, but in a more generic way. Of course, if you go to short scales, the pieces which are dominating are the ones that are highlighted there in red, and of course, you reobtain re the transformation that I described uh, earlier. Why is that uh, interesting to think in terms of uh, this coordinate transformation in general? As I said, because it's uh, applicable uh, directly uh, without any approximation, and is also related to the equivalence principle, because here what you're using is basically the equivalence principle. And therefore, for instance, if there are sources of violation of the equivalence principle, for instance, if you have a fifth force, like people like to play with uh, in modified gravity, then of course the consistent relation might be might be violated. So let me go back to the uh, bias. If, I, if, I, if you remember, I said that the bias is a crucial ingredient when you deal with the real universe, because of course we observe galaxies, we don't observe the dark matter in, in phase, and we need to find a way to relate the galaxy distribution, the density contrast to the density contrast of, of dark matter. So one of, the one of the consequences of this uh, symmetry that I highlighted is that uh, it turns out, in fact, that the, the bias is not local as it is written in this, uh, in this uh, uh, equation. Okay? Local means that uh, the density contrast of galaxies is a, function, is a local function of density contrast of, of matter. And here, you should use the same principle that uh, we use in field theory. So in field theory, we say if you have a symmetry, then of course all the operators that you can write down which satisfy the symmetry should be written down. And therefore, if there is an underlying symmetry that is um, uh, satisfied by the equation of motion or by the dynamics, then in principle you should write down all the possible invariants of the symmetry relating the galaxy density contrast with the uh, dark matter density contrast, okay? So there is not only the local pieces, but you, you have a lot of other operators that you can write down, uh, and those are invariants, so they are left invariant by the symmetry that I wrote before, okay? Those pieces are called non-local. They are not non-local in the, in the field theory uh, language. They are non-local because just to be distinguished from the local pieces, which is the first line I wrote there. This is some nomenclature that people in cosmology use. I think it's incorrect, but uh, nevertheless, this is what people are uh, using. Not only that, but if you use the Lifshitz symmetry that I, I, I spotted at the beginning, you can also predict the time uh, behavior of the pieces that I wrote down there. Okay, so you, you cannot only, you only, um, you, you can uh, predict they are there and also you can say how they behave as a function of time. 
And this uh, non-local bias has been detected by simulations. So for instance, here, for I don't know if you can see from the bottom, but the, the, the red lines is basically the curve that indicates one of those non-local pieces, which are predicted by, by, um, uh, by these uh, asymmetry arguments. And uh, not only it's there, and also the time dependence is correct. So that's, of course, very, very interesting, because only by symmetry argument you can get um, two birds with a stone, so to speak. Now, uh, let me point out one thing that I, I didn't say uh, clearly, uh, which is the following, that this consistent relation that I wrote here, they vanish uh, when you take equal time. So if you take a, a, a three-point correlator, for instance, and you evaluate all the points at equal time, which is, of course, what the observers do most of the time, this um, uh, consistent relation on the right-hand side vanishes, okay? It has this uh, property. And the, the reason is very simple, because if you remember, I have doing this coordinate transformation or, do, or using the symmetry, I have eliminated the zero mode of the perturbation and the first gradient. And of course, I've, so, so to speak, I have eliminated the homogeneous part of the, of the gravitational uh, potential, which is, of course, does not distinguish uh, uh, the points enough. Now, I can ask myself, uh, what can I do if I go at equal time? Well, you can do something. You can expand your long wavelengths mode at one more derivative, so you go to second derivative. Of course, the equivalence principle is telling you that now that uh, you cannot eliminate the second derivative because that's a physical, it's a physical perturbation. So, but the equivalence principle tells you that, in fact, the, this long wavelengths mode that you have if you want to remove it, you can do it, but of course your universe will become uh, closed, will have a small curvature. This is the, the price you have to pay. Okay? And this curvature there, that is indicated by k, it will, be, will be proportional directly to the long wavelength mode that you are eliminating. So, despite of that, you can ask yourself, what, what can you do with that? Well, uh, you have to change your, uh, your, your point of view. You now you have a sort of unperturbed universe from the long wavelength point of view, but it's closed, has a small curvature. So you have to change slightly the, the scale factor, and it gets shifted by this long wavelength mode. You have to change, of course, slightly the average density, because, of course, if you have a, a universe with a small curvature in it, the, the locally this universe uh, has a, an average density which is shifted. And then, if um, uh, you can trade the, the time with the growth factor, which is, which is the, the, the function that tells you how the linear perturbation are growing, then uh, only by this simple argument you can write down an exact relation between, for instance, the, the three-point correlator and the two-point correlator, which people uh, will measure. Okay? So again, this is only for dark matter, unfortunately, not for galaxies, so uh, this is good for other reasons. But you can write down, you can predict the three-point correlator on short scales as long as one of the modes is long in terms of the two-point correlator. Okay? And those quantities are fully nonlinear. So the, this relation has to be true, because otherwise you are breaking one of the assumptions that uh, you, you started from. This is just, again, uh, a, you can also get the same result uh, using, again, the symmetries. There, the symmetry is, is written down. You see, the point here is that, according to that symmetry, the density contrast uh, th this time transforms nonlinearly, so you can go to a coordinate system where you can eliminate directly the, the long wavelength mode, and you have to pay the price of a small curvature. That's it. Let me go back, uh, and this is the last transparency, to the, to the point I highlighted before. If you remember, uh, my starting point were the fluid equations. Uh, there are some limitations, of course, to them, so I just want to, to uh, assure you that the same symmetries are also valid in, uh, if you go to phase space, which is the exact uh, starting point. So you can redo the same, uh, the same analysis starting from the phase space of dark matter, for instance. So, writing down the, the equation of motion, the Vlasov equation for the distribution in, in phase, uh, in momentum uh, space and in coordinate space of the, of the dark matter. And you can basically redo all the, um, the arguments and try to find more. And this is what we are investigating right now. And that's important, as I said, because, of course, uh, by simulations, 
there are, you, uh, people see that there are multi-streams, mainly when, when the collapse starts forming, then of course particles, there are flow of particles, at one point you have different velocities. So the, the fluid approximation break, breaks down. So conclusions, uh, I try to convince you that symmetries are a powerful tool to characterize the cosmological perturbations. Uh, people have been using it in the early universe in inflation, but uh, it can be applied also to the late universe. And uh, they are good, of course, to understand a lot of fundamental properties of the galaxy bias, to verify theories of um, modified gradient, for instance, and also to check the analytical appro um, approaches. Now, before concluding, uh, I have to uh, thank the organizers because, of course, um, as I said at the beginning, they, 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 especially Enrico, he was so, uh, so, so good in, in collecting all people. And I, I have to say it was also, or they are, they are also very brave because, I don't know if you, Ricardo Rattazzi, remember, but back in the year 2001, when, uh, when Ricardo was approaching the 60th birthday, we were talking about organizing something. And Ricardo said, if you even think to organize something, I will, dots, and every dot corresponds to the, to the word, so you can figure out what he said, till you reach the top of the tower. And do not automatically assume it's the one in Pisa. <laughs> okay, and I will conclude here. Thank you. Uh, questions, please? Okay, maybe. I don't see. Uh, I, I can ask one. Ah, first Gabriele. Just curious about something. I mean, yes. you said that the symmetry um, implies this non-local bias. I mean, yes. I find it a little bit strange. I mean, usually a symmetry forbids something. Uh, yes. Uh, I mean, it allows, but it allows. Yeah. It allows non-local terms. Does it really <coughs> predict? -local? This is what I. Uh, this is what I wanted to say. So let's see. Okay. So here is the the equation. So. My argument is very simple. In fact, this is what you just said. I said, if the symmetry permits writing down such terms, such terms might be there. It's not automatically that they have to be there. Now, it turns out that, in fact, they are. They are. And in fact, this is, this is, uh, so those terms, the second, the, the third, and the fourth line are no local terms with this, uh, uh, in this language. And uh, as I said, uh, this red line, this is, of course, a simulation. The red line shows the appearance of one of those long local terms. The others appear too. Yeah. Yes. They appear physically uh, as it should, you see, because the collapse, I mean, the, the, the real prayer is gravity, right? Gravity is, is, uh, is non local. So, in that sense, uh, it's not surprising. It's not surprising. In fact, if you do a, perturb a perturbative computation, you will see these terms born coming out. The, the, the nice thing is that the, this uh, argument tells you not only the, 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 the sh they might be there, not, but they also t give you the, the, the time behavior, and it seems that uh, it's correct. We, we are run, now running simulations in, uh, in Geneva, and, uh, and uh, it was quite nice to see the time dependence uh, appearing. Of course, this argument, as, I, as it's written there, it's only during matter domination. When, when the universe starts becoming dominated by dark energy, this uh, property gets lost, but you can do some perturbative computation to see how, you know, you know what is the time scale for that information to be, to be lost. Yes, please. Ah, first. Yes. With comment, but since this is a nonlinear symmetry, you can also use it to tell some terms should be present to enforce it. It's like when you have a sigma model, right? The higher order terms in the expansion of the field are controlled. You are talking about the bias now, or, uh, or in terms general? In your, I mean, in general, I'm, I'm just a comment to what Gabriele mm. was saying, that the symmetry is used to forbid terms, Yes. but it can also be used to imply. Yeah, I, I, I fully agree with I, that. I would like to understand whether this is the case or not. I mean, whether you can use this to deduce the presence of other terms at the higher orders. Yeah, so, no, no, of course, I mean, there is a principle by which you can write down all the terms. Here we stop, you said the last term, the Tij term, appears only at third order. So you can write down, you know, many other combinations, okay, of course. 
but uh, but those will be very difficult to to not only to measure you know in real in reality but even by embody so i don't think it's so worth to go uh, so so far yeah but you're totally right i mean i can write, i can go on uh, quickly yes yes please How do you fix the Lipschitz exponent z? Oh yes, that's a nice, nice uh, question. The Lipschitz exponent is uh, is fixed because, of course, uh, the perturbation starts non-linear. Uh, sorry, linear. Okay, when they come out of uh, when they re-enter the horizon, and there you match the the perturbation. Uh, you match the this relation to the linear part, and it fixes z equal one. So it turns out that the transformation of time is in fact the same on space. There are small corrections along the way, but of course in this argument z is a constant. I mean, of course, it's just a number, okay? But uh, so you fix it, uh, you match it to the linear perturbation theory. Yeah. And it turns out uh, quite amazing that z equal one. This has been known, as I said, from the 70s. It's not our result, of course. Okay, in this case, if, <laughs> if all the questions are exhausted, I will ask one. Uh, yes. What about what happens with your symmetry in gauge invariant formalism? You fix the gauge and work on that. But yes. So as I said at the beginning, all the all the symmetry I work out is in the non-relativistic case, which is the most interesting one because, of course, you know structures are non-relativistic. And uh, um, so, from the practical point of view, um, it's uh, that's enough because, of course, on non-relativistic case, all the gauges collapse to are the same. Okay. Now, if you want to do something more, uh, more um, on the relativistic side, you, you should use this, uh, this argument. So you can, okay, this is in the Poisson gauge, but I, I think you can rewrite, in fact, in terms of the Bardeen potential and redo exactly the, the same. Yeah, so there is, a, in fact, there is even a more interesting question. Um, going beyond the a gauge is interesting and has, you know, something that you have to do. But of course, when you, when you, when you observe the real universe, you want something which is an observable, so does not depend uh, on the gauge, of course. Okay, so in fact, you should rewrite all the all the terms, all the density contrast, everything in terms of something that you really observe. So you have to take into account the fact that you observe a galaxy, light is traveling from you, so you have to take into account, the, uh, you know, the, the deflection of the path of light and so on. So you should you should apply, you should see the symmetries um, is. Uh, a good symmetry in that case too, and for as far as we could see, it is. Okay, so in fact you should go beyond gauge independence, you, you should really go to a real observable quantity, which is not equivalent to say it's gauge dependent. Okay. Okay. Let us thank the speaker again. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.